how many of us are aware of how powerful the beliefs that we hold and the words that we speak are? Uriah, got some people? Okay, good. There's a lot of us, well, maybe not in this room, but a lot of us are completely unaware of how powerful our beliefs are and how powerful the things that come out of our mouth are. It's my personal belief that the combination of belief, words, and thoughts literally create the entire reality around us. And so I want to share with you today some ways in which you can become aware of the beliefs that may be interrupting your life, maybe impeding exactly what you want to do, and maybe not serving you. You'll hear me use that term a lot. Is it serving you or is it not serving you? When I say that, I'm asking if the thing that you think or the thing that you believe or the thing that you speak is serving the purpose that you intend to have in your life. And I'll be using as a reference a book by Don Miguel Ruiz, The Four Agreements. I'm a licensed professional counselor, and The Four Agreements has become one of the cornerstones of my practice because I've seen over and over again that when somebody can consciously begin to practice The Four Agreements, their life begins to change. And it's simply because they become more aware of themselves and they become more aware of the beliefs they hold and more aware of the words they speak. Now I'll skip around a little bit. I'm not going to start with the first agreement, so just stay, stick with me. But first we need to figure out what an agreement is. Well, we make, we make agreements throughout our lives. As children, as adults, and these agreements can be the product of a traumatic event. Something happens and you create a belief about what happened that you may not even realize affects you today, but it does. Different beliefs that we were taught, if you were raised in any specific religious or denomination, um, you may hold beliefs that you don't even know where they came from. You don't know why you believe them. Somebody just told you at one time that you should. Cultural programming, same thing. And one thing I love about the United States is how many different cultures we have. Nowhere else in the world can you go and experience so many different cultures all in one country. And I think that's pretty awesome. But each one of those cultures has their belief systems, their agreements that they've made that determine how they interact with themselves and how they interact with the world around them. Religious indoctrination, I think that's one that we see um, quite prominently here in the United States, but that's changing. And it's changing because people are starting to become aware of themselves, their beliefs, and their words. Racism, hatred, chauvinism, etc., any of the isms um, are a product of beliefs that we hold that we're either aware of or we're not. And then, of course, you've all heard it's always been like that. That's why we do it. And traditionalism um, affects us in, in a large way. And it's not all bad. That's not what I'm saying at all. It's not good or bad. It just is what it is. And the only thing I'm asking is that you become more aware of how it is affecting your life and whether it's serving you or not. So it is what you choose to believe that makes you the person you are. See, there's the key word there, choose to believe. How many beliefs do we hold that we didn't choose? How many beliefs do we hold that were given to us by those before us and that we're just going through life? Yeah, I believe that. I don't know why I believe it. It's not really serving me, but here I am. So I've got an example of a belief or agreement that I made as a kid that I later found was not serving me. And that is the question, am I man enough? So <laughs> I was always a very emotional kid, very in touch with my femininity. Uh, I would cry during like movies and sometimes I'd get made fun of or whatever. Um, and no one ever actually told me like, hey, it's not okay to cry in movies or hey, you shouldn't be so emotional or hey, you shouldn't be so feminine. It's just like I adopted this 
this belief because, you know, whether people make, made fun of me or whatever it was. And so I started to take on the agreement that if I was to be masculine enough or manly enough or serve my place as a man in this world, that I would need to be perceived by the people around me as masculine. And so I would shut off that femininity, that femininity and I would engage in activities that I really didn't like to do, but I was doing them because that's what men do. You know, I would watch football. I'm not a big football fan. No problem admitting that today. You would ask me 20 years ago, I would have been like, oh yeah, man, I love football. Yeah, yeah. And, but I was pretending. I was wearing a mask so that I would be perceived as masculine. I can't tell you how many times I've went duck hunting and absolutely dreaded it and hated it, but I did it because all of my law enforcement buddies were doing it. And if I was gonna be manly enough for them, I needed to do it too. And it wasn't until I became aware of this agreement that I had unconsciously made that I was able to stop doing things that I didn't really wanna do and just be me and accept my divine femininity and my divine masculinity. I'm a perfect balance of both. And thank, thank goodness I had a therapist that told me an androgynous male is one that is just as in touch with his feminine side as his masculine. And so here I am and I love who I am. So the second agreement, I told you I was gonna skip the first, we're gonna come back to it. The second agreement is don't take anything personally. Now, <laughs> sounds a lot easier said than done, right? I mean, cause somebody calls you a name, it kind of hurts or uh, you know, your, your spouse doesn't give you as much attention as you'd like, different things like that. And we take it as there's something wrong with me. Well, that's not exactly true. And so to avoid to take things personally, there's a few things that you can do. First, you realize that everything someone says or does has everything to do with them and nothing to do with you. Okay, well, that sounds cool, but it's still kind of hard, right? So take the example, if someone was to call me stupid, I don't consider myself stupid. I actually think I'm a pretty intelligent person. And so if somebody was to call me stupid, I would understand that whatever reason they have for calling me stupid is because they feel stupid or maybe they're intimidated by me or who knows, but it has nothing to do with me and it surely doesn't mean that I'm stupid, right? And that's a small example. There's, you know, when you're deeply emotionally connected to another person, it makes it a lot harder not to take things personally than, you know, just some jackass on the road that kind of calls you a name or something, right? So the next thing you can realize is that when somebody does or says something to you that you initially take on as hurtful or you take it personally, and it, guys, this isn't a perfection thing. I'm not asking you never to take something personally again. I'm asking you to become aware of when you do so that your reaction does not follow and hurt you and not serve you. Okay, but when people do or say something that you take personally or that would be a trigger for you, they're giving you a look into their personal reality. They're showing you exactly how they feel. And so instead of taking something personally from that place, you can allow empathy to take over. This person called me stupid. Wow. I don't know what it feels like to feel stupid. I haven't felt that way in a long time, but I imagine it doesn't feel good. So how can I empathize with this person instead of taking what they said about me personally? Now another's perception of you is entirely derived from their own programming and judgments. This goes back to the agreements. What agreements has this person made? What beliefs do they hold that are causing them to make judgments about me? And is that something I need to get angry about? Or is that something, again, I can practice empathy with and see that maybe they're ignorant or misguided or maybe my example can show them a better way to be. When you take something personally, you accept the poison that another has spit at you. When somebody does or says something with the intention to hurt you, and sometimes it's not even with the intention to hurt you, the minute that you take that personally and you allow it to change your perception of yourself or that person, you've been poisoned. And that poison spreads and spreads and spreads and then it turns into resentment and anger 
And it takes you away from the beautiful place of peace that should be the empire. Being angry or resentful does not hurt the person you're angry or resentful at. It hurts you. Something ever happened, you get angry, and you're like, oh, yeah, if I could just show them or, you know, teach them a lesson. Who's that affecting? Are you able to be joyful in that moment? They're robbing your peace, but they're not robbing it at all. You are. Don't make assumptions. This is the third agreement. Assumptions get us into trouble, um, especially in partnerships, marital relationships, intimate relationships. Have you ever heard um, somebody say, well, they love me, so they should know what I want, right? Yeah, I know I've said it a time or two. If she really loved me, she would know that that's not okay with me. Right? Well, that's, that's an assumption. It's an assumption on your part because you're assuming that she knows what you want, or he. And it's an assumption. It would be asking them to make an assumption too in assuming what you want. Assumptions create a story that's not true. When you make an assumption about somebody, something, some, any assumption, you begin to create a story in your head that's just not true. And that story snowballs and gets bigger and bigger. And next thing you know, you're jealous and you're angry and you're resentful and you're just spewing poison all over the rest of the world. You're not contributing to raising the collective vibration. You're taking away from it. So an important aspect of not making assumptions is to ask questions. Instead of assuming that you know what somebody needs or wants or assuming you know how some situation is going to turn out, Ask questions. Speak your truth. Ask for what you want. Ask for what you need. Set boundaries. Is anyone unclear as to what a boundary is? Well, it doesn't matter anyway. I'm about to tell you. Okay, so a boundary is not an ultimatum. It's not saying if you do this, you know, I'm going to leave you or, or whatever. Now, okay, that can be a boundary, but it's not, it's not an attempt to create to control another person, okay? That's where boundaries are abused. But a boundary is allowing yourself to let somebody know that if they mistreat you, you're going to do something about it. So it's if you do this, I'm gonna do this. If you raise your voice at me, I will leave. And I'll come back later, we can talk about it. But you're not gonna, you're not gonna talk to me like that. That's a boundary, okay? Boundaries assist in not making assumptions because if your intentions and what you're going to do if somebody mistreats you is very clear, there's no assumption to be made. And if you leave because you said you were going to leave, they can't be like, well, they left because of this, this, and that. Nope, I told you why I was going to leave. Remember that nobody can read your mind, including your partner. Assumptions are nothing more than judgments, and you should be honest with yourself about your judgments towards others. See agreement two. That goes back to don't take anything personally. What do we say? When somebody does or says something to you, they're giving you insight into who and what they are and what they're experiencing. So the same thing happens when you do that to somebody else. Most of us say we're pretty private people, but then when we make assumptions or judge another person, that's not very private. We're giving them a clear picture of who we are and, what we, and how we feel about ourselves. Now, how often do you assume that another person's actions are because of you? Th this ties in with not taking things personally too. You know, you send a text and the person that you text doesn't immediately respond or, you know, takes 10, 15 minutes, 20, they don't respond as quickly as you thought they should. And so you start creating this story of, Maybe they don't like me anymore. Maybe they're mad at me. Maybe, you know, I said something wrong. Maybe I offended them. That's just a story. We don't know. And so you've created, and here's the sad part. When we create these stories, we create them so that we're the bad. We're, we're unworthy. We're unlovable. This person didn't text me back fast enough because they don't like me anymore. What does that mean about your perception of yourself if you assume that somebody doesn't like you because they don't text you back? The fourth agreement is by far my favorite because while it may not be the easiest to follow, it's the beautiful one that gives grace. Always do your best. 
Now, throughout your entire life, past, present, future, the only thing that you will ever be able to do is your best. Plain and simple. Six years ago when I was an alcoholic going through a divorce, leaving the church, deconstructing Christianity, I, oh my goodness, I, you know, I look back and sometimes I'm like, golly, what was I doing? Like, who, like I was narcissistic and hurtful and all sorts of things, but I was doing my best. It's all I knew because of the beliefs that I held, because of the agreements that I had made, doing my best to survive, to cope with the life that I had created for myself at that time. And today, my best looks a hell of a lot different than my best back then, but it was still my best. And so always do your best allows you to give yourself grace and know that no matter what, that's what you're doing. And it doesn't matter about the person you were six years ago or the person you are today. You're a person that is deserving and worthy of love and deserving and worthy of forgiveness. And it all starts with loving yourself. So in this practice of the four agreements, you're not going to be perfect. You're going to take things personally. You're going to make assumptions, but it's recognizing that and then saying, I did my best and I'm going to do my best tomorrow and the day after that. Your best may look very different on a day you have the flu than it does on a day you don't. And that's okay. So in this, we're becoming aware of the beliefs that no longer serve us. So limiting beliefs are a big one. When I started my practice in Big Sandy, the biggest limiting belief, and I was completely unaware of this at first. I'm aware of it now, thank God. But the first limiting belief is I can't start a counseling practice in a town that only has like 2,000 people. I'm not going to have enough clients. I'm not going to have enough people to like support this and make it happen. So I, I opened an office in Tyler too. I had two offices going. And I'd, it, in the year and a half that I had an office in Tyler, I saw like 10 clients there. But my big Sandy one was just blah, overflowing with tons of people. And, and I was just like, and that's when I recognized the limiting belief. I did this. <laughs> I'm, I'm the thing that's holding me back through my limiting beliefs. So when you're thinking about what you want for your life, you ask yourself, like, what beliefs do I hold that's telling me I can't do this? Because those are bullshit. You can do anything you want to do. You can be anything you want to do. But it's going to be a lot easier if you become aware of what beliefs you hold that are holding you back. Do you do things that you don't want to do? Any people pleasers in here? Not current, maybe, you know, maybe healed people pleasers. The belief that you have, that many of us have in, in, in American culture, is that if we're not constantly sacrificing of ourselves for everyone else, then we're unlovable. We're going to experience rejection. And so we give of ourselves. We're pouring from an empty cup constantly and wondering why we're depressed and wondering why we experience anxiety and wondering why we can't seem to feel good. That belief, if you can become aware of it, you can replace it with my cup matters. I get to fill my cup first and then everyone else gets the overflow. And then you're running around with a full cup, you're happy, you feel good, and you're just radiating positivity and high vibe, all of the good stuff, right? And everyone's like, man, I want some of that. And you're like, well, stop doing stuff for people. And they're like, what? I can't do that. They won't love me anymore. Yeah, they will. They'll love you more because you're taking care of yourself first. Love yourself and then love your neighbor and all the other people. Am I being my authentic self? When I was talking about masculinity and femininity a second ago, that was the mask I wore. I can't be my authentic self because if people know who I really am, they will reject me. They won't love me. But that mask was heavy, y'all. That mask weighed on me. And it was always this belief that I wasn't good enough, that who I was at my core wasn't good enough. It was a lie, turns out. Now, what beliefs are keeping me from doing what I want to do? That's right back to limiting beliefs. No one's going to help you become aware of these. I mean, you can, you can get help with it, but ultimately, you have to do it. You have to do it. We can't blame anyone else. Now we get to the first agreement. 
to be impeccable with your word. Now, I started this out by asking if you knew how powerful your beliefs and your words were. This is the one I say for the end because to me, this is the most important agreement because everything that comes out of my mouth has the power to create or the power to destroy. And unfortunately, well, not unfortunately for me, well, maybe a little bit sometimes. Nope, never mind, I'm not even gonna say that. Uh, you see what, you yeah, know, mm-hmm. So, <laughs> sometimes we're unconsciously going around saying things, having no idea that we're perpetuating the same crap over and over and over and over again in our life. Until one day we, we realize, we're like, oh my gosh, I've said this my whole life and I was just joking around, but oh my gosh, like, you know, it's, it, and it's funny because we do that and we're like, you know what, this person's going to do this and they're going to say this and they're not going to like me. And then they don't and you're like, see, I told you. Self-fulfilled prophecy comes from words too. What are you speaking into your life? So you begin to filter your language through the question, is this what I want? When you say something, it should immediately be followed by the question inside your head. Is that what I want? Is what I just said what I really want for myself? Because if not, why are you saying it? You speak your truth always when you're impeccable with your word. If you don't want to do something, you say you don't want to do it. There's a model in therapy that is <laughs> brilliant, but it's very simple. It is radical honesty. And that is constantly checking yourself to make sure that you are not only being honest with yourself, but you are being honest with the people in your life that you're interacting with. If somebody says, hey man, you want to come over to the house? We're going to you know, grill some hot dogs and watch football. I'm going to be like, no, nah, I don't want to do that. And they're going to be like, well, I thought you were my friend. I'm like, I am your friend, but I don't want to do that. Well, and then how they take it is not my responsibility. My responsibility is to be honest about what I want. And then we use our love, our, we use our language to love and lift others up instead of tearing them down. This is the creation versus destruction thing. Are we destroying people in our lives or are we building them up, giving them life, breathing life into them? You do what you say you're going to do. That's a good, re, a good way to be impeccable with your word. But that's like just scratching the surface. You avoid gossip and slander, including towards yourself. I've been around people where when they gossip and, you know, I've, I'm not above this. I've done it myself. But it's just this uncomfortable energy. And that gossip is also spewing poison into your surroundings. And so when you participate in gossip, you're spewing the poison and you're absorbing the poison. The words you speak become the house you live in. Now, I got to cut this story super short. But as I tell this story real quick, I want you to become aware of your thinking towards the story that I'm telling you, okay? Because that's going to give you some insight into what your beliefs are too. Because I wanted some proof that the placebo effect was real. I was studying Joe Dispenza. I was like, I need something. And I'm sitting there around a fire and a mosquito lands on my hand or on my arm. And prior to this, I had said, you know, if there's a mosquito within 10 miles, it's going to find me and bite me. My blood tastes amazing, apparently, because I get bit all the time. And it hit me in that moment. Oh, my. No wonder I get ate up. I've been saying that for years and years and years. And so in that moment, I said, you know what? Mosquitoes don't mess with me. Mosquitoes don't want to have anything to do with me. Anytime someone brought up bug spray or mosquitoes or anything, I, no, they don't mess with me. Oh, man, there's so many mosquitoes. Out. What mosquitoes? Where? I don't see them. Mosquitoes aren't in my reality. Now, right now, think, uh, what are you thinking as I'm telling you this story? Pfft, whatever, Brad, this is ridiculous. That is an agreement you've made. That what I'm telling you right now can't possibly be real. That's a limiting belief. So ask yourself how many times someone has mentioned something to you that might enrich your life and how quickly doubt came up. Now that's not going to work for me. Is that what you want? Do you want to continue living your life doubtful that you are the powerful creator that you are? Do you want to continue living your life doing things and saying things that aren't in line with who and what you want to be? 
Or do you want to take control and start using your words and your beliefs to create the life that you want for yourself? These are some quick examples of, if, if there's a bug going around, I'll catch it. How many times do you hear people say that? Is that what you want? Do you want to get sick every time someone else complains about being sick? I don't. Nothing ever goes my way. I'm always broke. My body always hurts. I never sleep well. Those don't sound good. It's not what you want, right? So again, all of this is to help you become aware of your beliefs, your words, and whether or not they're serving you. And it's only between you and you. You don't have to Oh, you don't owe it to anybody to explain yourself or anything like that. It's you. Become aware of it. All right, y'all. Thanks for listening. Hope this helped.